those credit points you're getting. Right? All those credit points you're getting. Uh, would it be counterintuitive if I said part of figuring out how to harness the power of fun is to recognize that it's okay to be unhappy? I get framed in the uh, motivational speaking category. A lot of what you hear people talk about are really powerful, but you find it very difficult to follow day in and day out. My message is no different. One of the ways that you, you can forgive yourself, life can be brutal, okay? And we sometimes are not set up to handle that and have the greatest mood, so it's okay to be unhappy. That's one of the steps, that's kind of cool. One more, who wants to go next? All right there. This will be my workout for today. Thank you. Make the choice to be happy, right? That's it. I know that in presentation, a lot of times you won't remember what I said. Guy wore a Phillies jacket and represented the fanatic was there and oh great, what a, but it's about, I'm gonna be happy, not sad. I'm gonna be a funster, not a fun killer. But my favorite, I'm gonna be Tigger, not Eeyore. Okay, we've seen Eeyore, right? I'm gonna be Tigger. That's the decision you have to make. In today's world, why is it so difficult to do that simply and be a master at the power of fun? Anybody? Why is it so hard to be? That's simple, right? I'm just going to be happy. What gets in the way? Life, exactly, right? Millions of years of evolution, we are still wired for fight or flight. We want the bad news first so we can take care of it. <laughs> All right. The billion dollar news industry. Right? They're blood, guts, mayhem, death. Blah, blah, blah. You're ready to quit. You turn it off, right? We're all wired to hear that bad news first. So I'm emperor of fun and games. I have it figured out, right? Not according to my wife. <laughs> oh, okay, emperor of fun and games. You know, yelling at the kids, throwing things around. All right. I'm just like the rest of you. It's a scary world. There's people outside our shores that want to do us harm because they're jealous of how we live our life and our freedoms. Politically, financially, we're into crisis mode, it's divisive, and oh my gosh, Kim Kardashian's almost a billionaire. It's a scary world, you know, and then I'm Tigger, <laughs> and I'm bouncing on Kim's head, and I feel better, so it works for me. All right, where did I learn all these great lessons of the fun? That, and that's, they're just like, uh, I've developed this theory of the power of fun, and there are laws. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but where did I learn them? From the big green guy. I worshiped at the feet of a master of the power of fun. From a business perspective, this is very interesting. 38 years he's been around. The Phillies have invested millions of dollars of time and money to create an initiative that distracts the customer from what they're selling. <laughs> all right, because in the sports we don't win all the time. But that's an interesting thing, distraction, right? My favorite quote, which I'll use up front because you'll forgive me, is we're distraction therapists pr practicing distraction therapy. Steve-O from the Jackass franchise, okay? <laughs> Still a great quote, okay? Still a great quote, because it's true. That's what the fanatic is doing. He's distracting you sometimes from what's going on the field that they don't want you to see. How many people have seen the fanatic on TV? Keep your hands up. How many people have seen the fanatic live? How many people have been hugged by the fanatic? How many people have been licked by the fanatic? <laughs> There's a couple. All right, we're going to send one over just like the hot dog. That gentleman right there. Go send him that $2 bill for being. Well, I've created a video here for you to show you the type of fun the fanatics have been having for 39 years. Ooh. Saratoga Springs, up there in, in New York land. I drive up, I don't know what I'm doing, I get there, the organizers say, David, we have new hires. 
We're going to put them into these seminars over three days, and we're going to throw a lot of challenges at them, and they need to come up with innovative, innovative and, and positive solutions for these challenges. And if they don't do well, they may not be with us at the end of the seminar. So there's tension. There's stress. We want you to break that in between the meetings and dance and hug and kiss and goose and high five and like, okay, I'm a professional. And over the next three days, I only work for about 45 minutes a day. And I'm having the time of my life. I'm knocking plates over. People are laughing. They're dancing with me. They're playing music. We get done with the closing session. They're patting me on the back and saying, David, this is the best session we've ever had, in part because of the fanatic. Thank you. All of these people are staying with us. I entertain rocket scientists dressed like a Muppet. I'm like, oh, that's great. I'm driving home. Yeah. I'm not thinking. Favorite story, and it's Steve's favorite story. Raise your hand, Steve. Steve's one of my best friends. He's one of the reasons why I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, so he said, are you going to tell the story about the, the Catholic Church service? Sure. It's the best story. Um, I'm doing a father-son daughter breakfast at St. Charles the Borromeo in Cinnamons in New Jersey, right over the bridge. Um, and and it, that makes sense, because I'm doing that spontaneous interactive fun. And I get done, and I think I'm finished. And one of the deacons from the church comes in and says, could you wait a minute? Because Father Dever, our youth minister, has a special request. So I'm expecting gray-haired, collar, venerable priest to walk in. Jim, Father Jim Dever comes running in, bouncing in the room. He's only six years older than me. He says, hey, David, how you doing? Father Dever, nice to meet you. I'm the youth minister. I get to do the homily today in the main chapel, and I want you to do me a favor. I want you to sneak in behind me and the altar boys during the procession and do something unexpected. <laughs> I said, Father Dever, I'm not Catholic. I don't know the domination of the fanatic, and this is church. I don't think we should be doing this. He goes, no, no, David, no, no, no. My homily is about the unexpected curveballs that life throws our way, and you'll set the tone. OK, it's OK with Father Dever. I'm assuming it's all right with the Lord. All right, let's go. So 20 minutes later, I'm walking down an aisle like this, 350 parishioners, right? And I'm walking down, you know, thinking, hey, you know, I've worked at a funeral, and Father Dever and the altar boys in the flowing robes and the smoke and the water, you know, I'm, I'm going down. My wife's a Catholic, so I know all this. So I'm walking down. The audible sucking in of air. Oh, no, what's he doing? As he came to the breakfast, he's not supposed to be here. Oh. So I'm like, uh-oh. But I'm committed. I'm halfway down. It's getting louder, this horrible sound, louder, louder. Father Dever gets to the end, puts his arms out in a welcoming pose. I grab him from behind the neck. I lay a big kiss on him. I turn, and I'm running. And I'm running because I think the torches and the picks and the axes <laughs> kill the monster. And, I, and I'm running, and, I, and I've seen the look of abject horror change to some smiles. Then as I'm halfway down, some laughter, a smattering of applause, as I'm turning to run out, they're standing and cheering, yay, fanatic, go Philly. And I look over my shoulder, there's Father Dever, smiling, laughing, applauding, and cheering, and they're doing just what I did 20 minutes earlier. It's all right with Father Dever, it's all right with the Lord, all right, fanatic, you rock! <laughs> I entertained a Catholic church service dressed like a Muppet. Okay, so the, imagine having a tool that's one of your go-to tools. You've got to do all the other things. I mean, all the other things within your profession of building great employees and developing culture, there, I know there's a myriad of stuff that I can't even imagine how you have to control that. But one of the go-to tools is to invest in some fun. And imagine if it works everywhere, every time, even at the toughest times of your life. It works, amazing, pretty dramatic, right? So now I'm gonna bring the house down. <laughs> this is a great place for these. N is for no, the battle cry of the fun killer. Any fun killers in this room? Come on, put your hands up. We've all done it, right? Are you a parent? You're a fun killer, trust me, okay? I know, I got two daughters, all right? But who are my fun killers? Let's, let's go through the point. I'm taking you through my journey. Um, Tommy Lasorda, okay? Uh, posing managers, uh, opposing players. Nobody was much tougher than the, the, uh, the groundskeeper. If I could just get rid of these idiots and spikes, my field would be beautiful. Like, not very much perspective at times, right? But no one, no one was worse than the ever dreaded band director. Oh my gosh. Anybody live near a high school? They're marching at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, and the band director's going, no, 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 that's not right. You're going to do it again. You're not going to go home until we're done. I mean, they, this, this is military stuff. And uh, so, but. I really got along with bands, and, and we had a lot of bands at the stadium before games, and the band directors even trusted me over some time. So it was really a, a valued piece of our entertainment. Well, the word got out, and then lo and behold, in the mid-'80s, the Dodgers called and said, send the Fanatic out on the next West Coast swing. We want him to entertain our fans pregame like he does in Philadelphia. 
Again, I'll mention I'm a professional idiot. All I did was go, oh my gosh, I get to go to new baseball fans. I can use my old material. I don't have to create anything new. I go to the standard stuff. This will be wonderful. I fly in a team plane. Mike Schmidt, Greg Lisinski, Larry Boa, hey, okay. And they're all excited I'm there. Hey, fanatic, we're taking you to LA. We're gonna have a great time. I go there, I stay in a team hotel. I dress in the locker room in Chavez Ravine the hallowed grounds of Dodger Blue. The players are so excited, they throw me out on the dugout. Boo! Oh, <laughs> yeah, I get it. I'm the fanatic, I'm the Phillies mascot. Of course they don't like me here, but I'm thinking, oh, I, you know, I'll try this, I'll try, boo, boo, boo. If anybody tells you that major league athletes are not affected by boos, uh-uh. It's the worst feeling in the world. I mean, it's like this, this horrible shroud that just drapes over you. And I'm going to the top step of the dugout to reboot because I can't take it. And then I see a band fall out to center field. I go, oh, run out, grab the drum majorette, give her a kiss, smattering of applause. I'm like, oh, I got him. And then suddenly I feel a vice grip on my arm. The band director has run from right field onto the field. He's grabbed my arm and he's screaming, get off the field, you're ruining the show. Being a good fanatic, I ripped my arm from his grip and I ran away from him and I started weaving in and out of the line of the band members. <laughs> and he's chasing me. Ah, get off the field. The kids aren't missing a note or a beat, but when their instruments come down, they're going, ah, look at our band director chasing the big fat green thing. This is great. <laughs> and they're doing their thing and we're chasing around. And now the place is going nuts. So from a comedic standpoint, I go, I went from the depths to ultimate exceeding expectations and success, I'm leaving. So I go run to right field where the band director came from and I'm stopped by this horrible appearance of two LA police officers running right on the field. And they're, they're the motorcycle cops, you know, chips with the leather gompers. And they got that nasty chin strap on and the bullets and the guns are flying and they're coming at me. I'm like, uh-oh, I'm gonna be thrown in an LA jail dressed like that. I'm not getting out. Now I've been distracted. The band director has caught me and he's so excited. He's got my arm. He goes, yes, come on, get him. Get him off the field. He's ruined the show and the police ran right past the fanatic, dragged the band director and dragged him right off the field. <laughs> oh my gosh, the band has... If I didn't have you, none of this would have happened. So, this, the fun killing thing is so important, and, and, you're, and I'm gonna switch a gear here. You can't do, especially where you are, you cannot create powerful fun that's gonna be helping engaging employees and building your culture and increasing productivity without fun killers. Because the first thing you need to do is, generally, they're like, oh, don't, don't call them, don't call them, they're gonna ruin it. But when you bring them in, some like, oh, you want, you want to hear from me? Okay. I'm, and you make them part of the team and they, and because they're smart people, they really just don't want us to fail. I'll give you the best example from history. Abraham Lincoln and Secretary, Secretary of State Seward. Seward was a great orator, a really amazing presence, and he was a staunch supporter of abolishing slavery. And he was Lincoln's best asset. Yet he said of Lincoln, I've never met a man so inappropriate at the most inappropriate times. Because Lincoln was a funster and he would have these debates and get in all kinds of, of difficult conversations and then he would stop and tell some stupid story that wasn't appropriate or, or, he, or wasn't even funny as Seward would say. And on top of that, he's not even funny. Um, but he used that to distract, distract in therapy. And then he would bring Seward in that would give this wonderful piece of information and without them working together. So the, the funster and the fun killer work together as a puzzle. Okay, so value fun. Fun works everywhere. We can't get too crazy with the creative people. We need somebody to come and go, whoa, hold on, to develop and make it work. Those are the three most important laws of fun. That's where you start. I'll get into how you do it in your own space, but that's where you start. So now I get two questions every time at this point in my speech, so I just give you the answers now. Number one, the first question is, David, how come your hair never moves? <laughs> it does, it's not important. The other one is the good one. Hey, you're, you're in the business of fun. You're not very non-biased. And yeah, I get it. I think you're right. I, I believe you're right. But you know, we're on the firing line here. We're going to get in trouble. Give me some proof. Give me some proof. So the next few slides are the proof. OK, here's the first one. About 500 miles west of Ecuador sits the Galapagos Islands. 
Did you know that the fanatic was born in the Galapagos? Do you know how I know? I made it up. <laughs> On a side note, if you're developing a character, make sure his homeland is an exotic location because your company may send you there, as the Phillies did. We brought the fanatic to the Galapagos in search of his roots. It is an unbelievable place. You can't go anywhere without a naturalist. They tell you where you can step, where you can't step. You can be around the animals which are not afraid of you, but you can't touch them. They had to find us a little space in the weeds for me to get Tom Burgoyne, who's the fanatic today and my best friend. We got him dressed in the weeds where Celso Maltavo, our, um, our naturalist, was with us. You want to Google Celso, great videos about no one's more passionate about the Galapagos Islands than Celso. We come out and the fanatic immediately goes places with this sea lion pup. Only 100 yards away is the sea lion pup's mother, because Celso had told us. And I stood there and I'm like, wait, Celso, how come that sea lion's mother doesn't come running over here and attack the fanatic? I mean, she doesn't know it's not a predator. I mean, it could be the fanatic could be eating that. And he said, oh, no, David, these sea lions, although they look like sea lions you've seen, they're, they're endemic. They're an endemic species. There's no other sea lions like this than in the Galapagos. And over millions of years, they've selected out a gene for fear because they don't have any natural predators that can get them in this sheltered environment. He said, I said, wow, that's amazing. He said, you know what else, David? They, the only way that they live is that the adult um, sea lions teach the young sea lions how to play so that then they can fish and that's how they survive because adults will not feed infirmed adults and most of them die of starvation. So that's how they thin the herd. And then I said, oh my gosh, Celso. And I quickly told him the power of fun. He started to shake. He goes, well then David, from nature, you have the greatest proof that a species not only survives but thrives because of the power of fun. I said, relax, Celso. Okay, good. I got it. But it's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, they have a gene for fear taken out because over millions of years it was very stressful on the species. They didn't need it. So now they thrive and they teach their pups how to play in order to, to live. Okay. Next one's a little bit more tougher and I'm gonna give you the time that I woke up and realized how powerful the Fanatics version of distracting fun was. Watch this video and just imagine how naturally kids do this and how Jaden, who had the worst of life thrown his way, what was his go-to reaction to solve it? We end tonight with a little boy with enormous power, the power to lift spirits. Here's Steve Hartman on the road. It is every kid's worst nightmare, and six-year-old Jaden Hayes has lived it ah! twice. First, he lost his dad when he was four. Then last month, his mom died unexpectedly in her sleep. I tried and I tried and I tried to get her For all of us at CBS News all around the world. Look at Scott, Scott Pelley. Pelley. Scott Pelley is moved by this too. And of course, it's the last story in the news. You know, we got rid of all the nastiness and then we did one good thing. Sick and tired of having everybody being sad. Sick and tired about having, you think that's what he's talking about himself. And then by no means is it a fix. There are other things in life we need to do to conquer our issues. But this was his go to thing. We suck this out of our children, they do it naturally. I lost my mother to brain cancer, same brain cancer that took uh, Tug McGraw when she was 59 years old. I'm 61 now, so it's amazing when I think about it now that I, I looked at her as an older person. 59 years old, she passed away uh, just a few weeks before Mother's Day, and then four weeks later I came home from a business trip to find a Dear John letter on my table where my wife was telling me, I'm taking your six-year-old son, I'm gonna go live with my mother. Believe me, I had some to do with that. But I remember a day later, 24 hours later, being in a fetal position in my home in Wilmington, Delaware, knowing without a doubt I was not going to make it, that I wouldn't be able to trust anybody, and I knew I, it was devastating for me. And then I realized I have to go do a two-hour appearance as the fanatic the next day. And I went, I, I can't do that. But I, my dad brought me up, my mom brought me up well. So I went and I did the appearance and I got done. I said, oh my gosh, I didn't think about anything. And I said, oh, that was amazing. 
And I realized that I was doing random, I was getting paid to do random acts of kindness. And it, you know what that does for you. You're giving just to give. And then the double effect back feeling good about it. It is amazing how fun will work for you at the most difficult times of your life. Forget about business. Think about we're all going to go through it. Life can be brutal. And the kids will tell you, hey, let's just have some fun. Really important. Mike Schmidt, the greatest third baseman to ever play the game. He's a Hall of Famer. And we hated him. We did. We didn't like him. He made it look too easy. We want somebody to get dirty and bloody. You know, and Mike didn't, Mike didn't have the skill sets to really connect to people. Now he does. But in this day, he moved from third base to first base because of his ailing knees. It was the end of his career, early in the season. gentlemen, your first baseman, Mike Schmidt. Oh, he got a standing ovation because he came out in a wig and sunglasses. Larry Anderson talked him into it. That's the power of fun. I believe that was the start of him redeveloping his relationship with the Phillies fans. He's now a, a, a beloved player, a broadcaster for us, and you should see Mike in public now. And I think it's all because he just recognized, hey, I got to just relax a little bit. Last video. Can the power of fun make us make healthier choices. out the right model, you get all the accoutrements, you know, and all the options, and you are so excited, you got this really unique car, and you drive off the lot, and then you see 30 cars just like it over the next 20 minutes. Because that's what you spent time doing. So watch this. Go to Emperor Fun, at Emperor Fun, and share some of your validations for me. Uh, and then I'll share them in a slide next time. Okay, now, how can you practically use it in your silos? You first have to find your fun factor. We describe our fun factor visually with $2 bills. They're funny money. It makes us smile. It makes us laugh. You need to go to your employees and ask them, what do you do for fun? It's usually a shared experience. You pull that information together, and you start to get the fun factor of your organization. I love to skydive. I'm scared to death of heights. Actually, you could develop a delivery around skydiving theme where both of them would have a good time. But you need to go out and ask. Uh, Undercover Boss, the first one with uh, waste management. You know, that, that was the very first one right after Super Bowl. I guess it was seven, eight, nine years ago. And they were all excited when they found out that their boss had come to work on the front line to, to understand how his decisions affected them. But there was a scroll across the bottom of the page that said productivity and waste management went up 28% because they believed that their leaders cared about them. If you go talk to your employees and say, tell me, what, what do we need to do? Do we need to do pictures up? Can we, your, your workspace, what do we need to do? Find the fun factor. Then follow the laws of fun. We've gone over all of them, but I'll breeze through them again. Leadership has to be invested. You have to believe it. You have to know it, that it's valuable. Okay? Nine to five fun suggests that fun as a surprise is more powerful. Surprise birthdays that are really a surprise are always the best event. You talk to people who's had them. So surprise your employees. Hey, we should be working. Nah, we're going to stop and take a break. Doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Doesn't have to be a lot of opportunity costs. They can be short term. Consistent culture of fun. Weave it through. Not just the end of the year celebration. Deep breaths. 
Think of the good in, the bad out, and then for 90 seconds, think about the thing that brings you the most joy in great detail. The smell of your grandkids' hair after a bath. Chocolate ice cream. Whatever it is that you really love, think about it in great detail. Stop 90 seconds. Your dance party. This is for you getting ready to go do something that you really need to be focused and feeling great about. I don't care whether it's opera or rap or country. Put your three or four best songs on, plug them in, and just sit there. And I'm, boy, does it motivate you to go out and, and get at whatever it is that's in front of you. Um, say you're sorry with no but. How many people know somebody they need to say sorry to? <laughs> this is where my wife comes in. Okay, Emperor. All right, it really feels good. It's almost like a random act of kindness. It, it'll, it'll make you feel smarter, too. Be grateful. Neil Pashrish's book, The Happiness Equation, go read it. He says you've won the lottery. Think of all the millions and millions of people that have passed before you and don't have the opportunity to take a breath. Don't have an opportunity to tell somebody that they love them. Don't have an opportunity to go out and play or go to work and enjoy themselves. Be grateful. And finally, smile. How many people have crow's feet in the room? Don't go get Botox, because this means you've been using the Duchenne smile for most of your life. It uses all the muscles of your face. You can't fake it, and it's the most authentic smile you can do. So celebrate your crow's feet. Those are the Fanatics' top tens, OK? Let me finish and give credit to you. Just have to be Tigger E or Randy Pausch, the last lecture. How many people have watched that? Grab a box of tissues and go watch it. It's amazing. And he says that he was a beloved professor at Carnegie Mellon University. He taught gaming program. People, students lined up to get into his class. And unfortunately, he contracted pancreatic cancer, and it took his life. And the sad part of it was he left a beautiful wife and some wonderful children. But he gave his tenured lecture, and he said, you know, you just have to decide whether you're going to be Tigger or Eeyore. He said, I, I think it's clear where I stand on that debate. Uh, fun for me is like water to a fish. I can't survive without it. And I'm speaking to you today to leave a legacy to my kids so they understand that. Abraham Lincoln said, and think about his life, he wasn't elected eight times. He fought mental illness. His wife fought mental illness. He witnessed the death of a son, and he was assassinated before he even got to see what we celebrated him for. And his favorite, my favorite quote of his, we're only as happy as we make up our minds to be. That's the choice. So here's what I'd love you to do, you human resource professionals that make businesses great. I want you to choose fun as one of the arrows in your quiver. I want you to be synthesized in the fun, and I want you to go out and master the power of fun starting tonight. Thank you very much, very, very much. Happy to answer any questions for the next few minutes. If you want to come meet me and try on a World Series ring, you can do that in a meet and greet afterwards where you'll get to see Phoebe. Any questions at all? Doesn't matter. It could be about the fanatic or about business, please. Where do you get that coat at? Where do I get that coat at? I paid for this coat. Mitchell and Ness over at the store in the stadium because, you know, when I was there, I got stuff for free and I didn't value it. Now I'm a fan. Now I got to shell out the money for it. I didn't. Um, I didn't. I, I, it was the greatest workout in the world. Um, uh, people have been kind enough to say, hey, you're 61, you look pretty good. And I said, well, for 17 years, I was pickled. I, I just, no, none of the elements.